Hello, hello. Welcome to Courage Becomes Her, where we connect and share real life stories. I'll talk with women whom I love and I'm inspired by. Women who are experiencing life just like you and me. I'm excited for us to gather together and cultivate confidence, courage, and joy in life and work. Hello, friends. Oh, welcome to Courage Becomes Her. Today, we are back with another bonus episode in our Summer Read series with author Shauna Pilgreen. So Shauna, along with her husband, Ben, co-leads Epic Church, a multi-ethnic congregation in the heart of San Francisco. She serves on the teaching team at Epic and also as a network director for Alpha USA. I've linked Alpha in the show notes for those of you who might not be familiar with it. It's an international organization that does courses on conversing in faith and life and God. So you can check that out. Shauna also writes for Everyday Evangelists on her blog and her website, which are also linked in the show notes. And please do take the time to connect with her on Instagram and Facebook that are also in the show notes. She's also a busy mom of four kiddos. So today in the conversation with Shauna, we're talking about her new book, Translating Jesus, How to Share Your Faith in Language Today's Culture Can Understand. I am just so grateful for Shauna and her courage to write this book and to uh, help each and every one of us grow in how it is that we talk about our faith in Jesus. So Shauna shares how to share the love and the goodness of Jesus with others. And in this conversation, we talk about doing so by noticing people, being curious, paying attention, being humble, listening well, getting out of our comfort zones, sharing our stories and praying. And we unpack quite a number of those. And it's just really helpful, insightful, and uh, just a really good conversation. She also talks about how all people are significant and loved by Jesus and that Though there might be some people who don't want Jesus in their life, more people do than we may realize. So I'm excited to share today's conversation with Shauna Pilgreen about her new book, Translating Jesus. Shauna, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm delighted to have you with me for this uh, bonus episode of Courage Becomes Her to talk about your book in just a couple minutes. It is so fun to be here with you, Laurel. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's get to know you a little bit before we talk about your book. So first and foremost, where is home and what? tell us a little bit about home life. Sure. So I get to call San Francisco home. Um, My husband and I, Ben, and our four kids have called this place home for 13 years now. Mm. We moved here to start a church. Um, We meet downtown in our city. And yes, we have raised four kids here. So uh, home life is busy. Yes. And that is very courageous for sure. So I love that. All right. What has filled your cup in the last day or so? Mm. I have the privilege of being a part of Alpha. That's a global thing, but I am a part of the Alpha USA team. And just recently, I got to spend some time with our team as we prayed and really just prayed over our country, prayed over for, prayed over churches and all that God is doing here in America. So Mm -hmm. that, that filled my cup. Yeah, I can see that. That would have been a pretty special time indeed. So, mm, so good. And I'll link in the show notes to Alpha for those of the Courage Becomes Her listeners who might not be familiar with an incredible organization and the work you all are doing. So thank you for that. All right. What is a current obsession of yours? Any genre? Mm, I love this question. I think the top of my head 
um, this will date me, but there was a series, TV series called Lost. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. I yeah. remember watching it. Ben and I would watch it when our youngest was born and you're up in the middle of the night with those feedings. <laughs> and we just recently re like remembered that series. And so when we have time, uh, we will, we will watch an episode of that. Rewatch. Wow. My other, um, current obsession is I love getting my nails painted. Yep. And mm-hmm. I love the names that come on the OPI colors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and sometimes I will like put one back because I'm like, oh, the name of the color doesn't resonate with me. But I recently got my nails painted with Red Vival in the city. Oh, I love it. That's perfect. This is good. That is very, very, very (laughs) fitting. Oh, so good. Good. I'll have to look for that color. Yeah. Yeah. So good. All right. Last question. What is a book that has transformed your life? I just recently read a book called The Watchmaker's Daughter. I cannot recall the author's name. However, he is known for writing some World War II books. But this was the story of Corey Ten Boom. Yeah. And I'm familiar with her story. I know when I was younger, I read The Hiding Place. But this was a beautiful, hard to read of her story. But what I love that he did is he brought in Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Mm. Audrey Hepburn, and Anne Frank, he involved even some of their their parts of their story when there was overlap. Wow. And when you think of courage, mm-hmm. when I think of courage, she she's one of those that topped the list for me. Yeah. 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 So being new to Courage Becomes Her, you won't know this, but um, that I asked that question of all of our guests in our regular episodes. And five of our guests have all named The Hiding Place as the book that has transformed their life. And really? it's just so fascinating to know like how how transformative it has been for so many women. So wow. just hearing her story. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Mm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for letting us get to know you a little bit. So we're talking today about your new book, Translating Jesus, How to Share Your Faith in Language Today's Culture Can Understand, which I just love that so much. So I think just to kind of uh, kick us off, like, as I was thinking, uh, reading through your book, like the number one thought that occurred to me is uh, Tim Keller, one of my favorite pastors and authors, talks about how when we're passionate about something that we will talk about it, that if we love a podcast, a restaurant, a movie, you know, whatever it is, that we will say something. And he talks about the same being true for ideologies and philosophies, which I know you believe as well. And one of the things that you say uh, in the book is that we want our friends to experience the goodness of Jesus, just like we've experienced it. And so I just applaud your courage to help those of us who love Jesus to be courageous to talk about him and to know, you know, how to do that. I um, want to read one of the quotes that is in your book that I just I think is so foundational to uh, your and my conversation and to the book. You say, not everyone wants Jesus, but more do than we realize. We cannot predict what our love will do or who will receive it. We also cannot let this unpredictability keep us from explaining the hope that we have in him, which is just so beautiful. So let's start by just you sharing why it is that you want us to be equipped to to share Jesus, to talk about Jesus. Yeah, Laurel, I um part of me I'm passionate about this because I I grew up in a home where sharing the love of Jesus was just a part of our everyday. Mm. So I do recognize that this has been instilled in me since I was a little girl. Um, things I I know I took this for granted growing up, but it's just something mm-hmm. that I watched my my parents do. And it was just a part of what we did. Like I, I grew up in an environment where I didn't have to be afraid 
to mm-hmm. share my faith and talk about Jesus. It's just a natural overflow of the conversations that we had at home, our prayer times and that kind of thing. So I do recognize that, that that's not everyone else's um, necessarily their, um, their history. At the same time, I live in a city where people are very authentic about their faith. If they know Jesus, you know it. If they don't know Jesus, you know it. So Mm -hmm. I think living in, in San Francisco for 13 years, I've just, you don't, it, and, and you just said it, like, it's that, it's that unpredictability. Like you just don't know who's going to be open and ready yeah. and those who would just say, Hey, not right now. But in my experience, I've not come across anyone who has been irritated or mad that I even bring up my faith. Hmm. Um, but like, even yesterday I went on a walk with a friend and we've been friends for or acquaintances for seven or eight years. And she's Mm. yet to follow Jesus, but she knows what I believe. I'm able to talk about it openly with her. She's able to engage more with me. And so it's just so it's, you just don't know who's going to be open to it. Who's going to be receptive to it when they're going to realize their need for Jesus. Mm. And I love that we get the opportunity to engage with people on a daily basis. Mm. That's Uh so beautiful. So beautiful. So I think, I mean, if I could summarize your entire book in in a couple of words, which it, it requires more than that, but you said it, it's be relational. Like that is the biggest thing, you know, to sharing Jesus is just to be, be relational, be in relationship with people. And I mean, the book is just chock full of all of these beautiful stories that you share of where you've had relationship and encounters, just like the woman that you said just a moment ago that you've known for seven years and went on a walk with and have a, you know, different faith system than she does and foundation than she does, but you're participating in life together. So I think that to me, because that is just such a cornerstone of this and seems so foundational I think it is maybe to you and to me and to others, but to some others, but not everybody to your point a moment ago really recognizes that. So talk a little bit about that because you talk Mm -hmm. about like noticing people, saying hi, asking their name, just, you know, kind of just that introductory thing that maybe has gotten even more complicated because we have a problem of putting our phones down. So yeah. talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And I would just, for all of us that are listening, like, you know, if Jesus is real, if Jesus is who he says he is, if we're depending and trusting him for our eternity, then he's got something for us today for mm-hmm. now. And I think sometimes we just need to be awakened and maybe even a little um, shaken up mm. to get recentered on that reality that he is who he says he is. He's not just for me. He's for everyone I'm going to encounter today. And I think in light of that, to your point, like setting the phone down, really looking in the eyes of the people that we'll encounter today, when we understand that reality, it is. And that's really what the first third part of the book is about, it's just paying attention. And I heard someone was telling me a story um, just the other day, how um, he was sitting in the break room at school. He's a teacher and another teacher, there was something going on maybe with the light switch or whatever, but this other teacher fixed it. And he said, hallelujah. And she goes, what did you say? And all because he said that word, she recognized that word. And they didn't even realize they've been teaching at the school for years together. They did not realize that they both were Christians. Wow. Um, But I think of just like paying attention to that, listening for opportunities to say something or what someone else is saying and just joining in on the conversation. Even if it's like someone says, you know, like, hey, you know, my friend's having surgery this week or, you know, my dad's battling cancer Mm -hmm. or, you know, today was just a really hard day. I think paying attention to those moments where we can bring the name of Jesus into this and not in a preacher style type of way, but just in a, Hey, listen, I'm a person of faith or, you know, prayer is just a rhythm I have in my life. Just coming Mm -hmm. up with some little, some little saying that in a winsome way, 
brings peace and hope and joy to a situation, you never know where it's going to go. You never know. Mm. And I found, and I believe this book really leads you into a lifestyle that really is, it's contagious. Like once you begin to look and pay attention and you, you start having these conversations, God brings you more and you start noticing more. Yeah. 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 That is so true. So true. I think I love that it's that the pain attention and just watching what is happening around you, being observing, observant. I really appreciate that you talk about that. I think um, you use the word curious quite a bit in the book as well, which seems like, okay, there's, you, you seem to indicate like, an invitation to get people talking and through that, through the medium of curiosity, I guess. So so talk a little bit about what you, your (laughs) method there or what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I think, you know, in, in the Christian world, I think maybe we look at the, we look at culture and we feel like culture is curious. That's why they, you know, one minute they're into this, the next minute they're into that. Mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's normal for us to look at culture as being curious. I think mm-hmm. sometimes we feel like as Christians we can't be curious because that maybe means we're not solid mm-hmm. in our faith enough. But mm-hmm. I would propose that we as Christians, being rooted and grounded in Christ and his word, we need to stay curious. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. we need to be paying attention to like what is culture paying attention to? I love yeah. I love that Paul being rooted in Christ as we know he was, he stayed curious about culture. That's, that's what gave him the winsome way of being able to step into Athens, learn the culture in order to speak into the culture. Mm -hmm. I think what, what ostracizes the church and even Christians from culture is that we've lost our curiosity. We don't even know how to connect with culture anymore. So when Mm -hmm. we try to connect with culture, we look so outdated (laughs) <laughs> so I think yes. for us as Christians, we need to be curious, but curious, yeah. curious on a foundation of Jesus Christ, which allows us to be able to explore what what is our culture into? What are they paying attention to? What are their pain points? Where are they searching mm. so that we can mm. speak into that? That's so good. I love that so much. I think you talk uh, several different times in different ways about this notion that we're really not as different from each other as we think we are. And I think it, it like there's a connection there to curiosity and to um, paying attention and to actively listening. You know, it's like we, when we are in a posture of curiosity and listening, I think we do recognize that we're not as different yeah. than we think we might be. What Talk just a little bit more about your thoughts behind that. Yeah, I think again, Laurel, and that's really my encouragement in the book is the idea is that being a Christian is not this linear path where mm. we've accepted Jesus and we're on our way to heaven and it's the straight line to mm. eternity. Rather seeing it as these well-worn paths between the gate and the cross and the table. And so the Mm. way I describe it in the book is that the gate is the marketplace. It's where we spend our time. It's where culture hangs out. And then the cross Mm. is our Christian community, our church, our, our intimate private time with God. And then the table is when the two overlap, when we find Mm. ourselves having a conversation, we're in a situation where it's, we see like, Christian and non-Christians in the same space. And so this idea of like, it's this well-worn path between all three. There's moments Mm. where I'm at the gate, but I need to go to the cross for repentance. And then I'm going to the table because I've got someone that's a believer and a non-believer engaged in work or at school or whatever. So this idea of this, it's just this, um, yeah, it's just this well-worn path between all three. And usually in a given day, we're at all three. Yeah. So yeah. it's this idea that we're we're constantly moving and engaging with different people um, at different places, and I think with that mindset, we realize that we're never we never want to just be stuck at one place. Um, mm-hmm. We want to be continually moving between all three. Mm, that's so good. 
So you you just alluded to it, but you talk about it in the book. Like we have such a tendency to stay in our comfort zones and to stay in our, I'll call it homogenized circles uh, that you don't label it that strongly. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be less kind than you are. And, you know, just only do life with, you know, with those people that are in our very tiny little usual circles. So how do we get to that place where we, you know, move out of those comfort zones, out of those, you know, tribal homogenized circles to be in a place where we're at the gate, as you call it, you know, with people who are different from us? Yeah, and I think I've got a little bit of advantage living in San Francisco where we've got the nations living here. So, Mm -hmm. you know, 13 years ago, I I was thrown into this culture um, to Mm -hmm. show the love of Jesus. And so on a given day, yeah, I definitely can find myself where, yeah, I'm having conversations with people who were born in this country, not born in this country, people who speak English, Mm -hmm. people who don't. So I realize I've got a little bit easier than maybe all the listeners um, paying attention today. But Again, wherever you call home, wherever you live, you've got people that are around you that do not think like you, vote like you, Mm -hmm. speak like you, live like Mm -hmm. you, but that does not mean that you're not called to do life with them. Yeah. And so the spirit of the living God who lives inside all of us who have a relationship with him, I promise you. He's not called any of us just to do life with people who think, live, vote, do yeah. life like us. Yeah. So I believe if we're paying attention to what the Holy Spirit is prompting our hearts to do, we are all going to be led into conversations in the next few days, whether mm. it's to pray for someone different from us, to lend a helping hand to someone else that's not like us. We're going to have opportunities if we're really paying attention. And yeah one thing I mentioned in the book is like, that's just where these unlikely friendships form. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I believe God's bringing these opportunities in front of us. And my Mm -hmm. prayer for everyone listening today is that we would pay attention because God really is wanting, um, he's wanting to draw us into these relationships, not because it's going to benefit that other person, Laurel, but it's also going to benefit us. We need, Mm -hmm. we need to be in relationships with people that are different from us. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if we're only in the church, we're missing part of the gospel. If we're only with people who are like us, we're missing part of the gospel. And it's Mm -hmm. not because we've got something just to offer them. They have something to offer us. And even Mm -hmm. there's even a pushback or, or maybe they don't believe what we believe, or they raise their kids differently than we raise our kids or their lifestyle just looks different. Um, we see all throughout the scriptures where the disciples in particular, and Jesus, of course, was engaging with people that weren't like them, that maybe the, the religious leaders would not have touched. But yeah. we can look at those stories. These are the stories that our sermons are made of and crafted about. But yet, oftentimes we don't choose to live that way um, in our own yeah. communities. I believe um, there's so much more that we can learn about Jesus as we engage with people who aren't like us. Mm, So true. Hello, friends, just popping in super quick. Okay, Ravel Baker Books is offering two copies of Shauna's book, Translating Jesus to the listeners of Courage Becomes Her. All that you need to do is head on over to my Instagram, Laurel Emery on Instagram to the August 18th post and the details to enter to win a copy for yourself are there. It's very easy and straightforward. So head on over to that. And can I ask that you please leave a rating and a review of Courage Becomes Her on whatever podcast platform that you are using? Just click that five star button and where it says to enter a review, I'd just put a, a sentence or two of what Courage Becomes Her means to you. I would be so grateful for you to do so. Let's get back to the conversation with Shauna. So, I mean, the elephant in the room, if you will, uh, underline that is that requires humility and letting go of judgment, which 
are two of probably the hardest things in life. <laughs> yeah. So how I know you talk about both of those, uh, you know, all throughout the book. So how do we do that? You know, Laurel, it's interesting. I've, I have found over the years as I am, you know, as best I can being rooted and grounded in Christ with my, my time with Jesus every day, knowing that I need him in me. I need the word of God in me. I need his spirit in me, leading me. So I, what I'm saying, I'm saying like coming out of that, like that is foundational mm. um, to the Christian, to the Christian life. And that's really what the whole point of the cross section is about. Mm. But having that in me, I have found over the years that often it is, um, and I will try to be kind with my words, but oftentimes it's other Christians yeah. that sometimes I feel judged by because they mm-hmm. see who I'm talking to. Mm-hmm. They see who I'm bringing to church. Mm. They see, yeah, who I'm, who I'm open to. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I actually feel more judged by other Christians, just as I engage with people who aren't like me. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, Laurel, that's probably the hardest part to swallow. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like, I really want to encourage Christians that like, we, we can't get so caught up in just our church and our Christian community that we completely miss out on the people Mm. who are so much like they want to know the love of Jesus, Um, but we have to go to them. So I never want it to be said that, that I just loved my Christian brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, I Mm -hmm. want it to be said that there was not one person that, that I engaged with that never saw the love of Jesus in me. And so I realize I'm, I'm pushing back against some things here with this book, but Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's time for that. I think it's time post pandemic for, um, for me to be okay. If I lose some Christian friends in this process, if it means that my non-Christian friends see the love of Jesus in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh. Well, and you talk about it a little bit and I, and this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, so I won't take us there too much, but that there is fear that is underlying that on both sides, uh, you know, of the equation. So I think, I mean, you, you talk throughout the book of that it, we won't do it perfectly. We won't be in relationship perfectly. Um, you know, we don't have to be polished, but that there is a calling out of that fear yeah even laurel as you were talking i was just thinking of even some recent conversations i've been in and the good news the good news is that jesus is for everyone yeah and so while there is fear in having the conversation or how this is going to go or what they're going to think of us and that it gets messy as we engage in these conversations and these friendships The good news in all of this is that Jesus is for everyone Mm -hmm. and Jesus is love and love covers over everything. So the, the best news in all of this, and again, I'm thinking of a conversation I was recently in with a mom whose, whose child is struggling with their identity. Mm -hmm. It's like the best thing I can offer you is Jesus because Mm -hmm. Jesus loves you so much and Jesus is for you. And again, I'm like, there's nothing better in all the world than to be able to offer Jesus. So even if I don't have all the theology and I don't know what this mom is going through personally as she navigates this life with her child, what I do know is that Jesus is for her child Mm. and Jesus is for her and he is love and he is good. And we follow the ways of Jesus. We look at the teachings of Jesus and we, we want to orient, we want to orient our lives around him. And so again, it's like, you know, we might, we might raise our kids differently. Our church Mm -hmm. might look different, but I love that the one thing that we can offer this world 
is the love of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's so good. So good. I think it, tying into that, like you talk about just the significance of every single person and every single individual. You have a, um, one of your sentences says, if every human is a unique creation of God, then every moment with every human is significant. And I, I think that ties so well with what you just said, that if we truly will posture ourselves of looking at this as and a unique experience, a significant experience that we won't take those conversations for granted. We won't take those people for granted that, you know, every Uber ride, every food delivery person, every barista, you know, that all of those are an opportunity for us to share the love of Jesus. So I love, love that so much. Yeah. If I can just, um, even just tell you a story. Um, I, I know a friend, a friend of mine was really at rock bottom in her life and she, she hopped in a ride share. I'm not sure if it was Lyft or Uber, but she hopped in a ride share and um, was getting a ride to the airport. And her driver just said, Hey, do you want to talk or would you rather just this be a quiet ride? And she said, you know what? I would actually appreciate the conversation. And so he just began to share his faith Hmm. and who Jesus is to him. And it changed her life. It changed, Hmm. it changed the path of her life. She was at rock bottom. He needed to hear about the love of Jesus. What I can tell you about her life is that it's affecting her work relationships. It's affecting the church that she's now a part of. It's affecting her extended family, all because of this one ride share. We never know. We never know. And I'm on the side of things where I'm grateful to God that he said something. That's right. Because I'm seeing Mm -hmm. a life that's been changed and how many more people have been touched. And Mm -hmm. so often we don't get to see the whole story. We don't get to see Mm -hmm. of what happens because of a conversation at the grocery store, how it affected how that cashier goes home and treats her family. We don't get to see it, but we don't also want to miss out on those opportunities. Yeah. 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 Well, and I love too, that you talk about in the book, like there can be that opportunity to actually, you know, share our stories, share our faith, but it also could just be a word of encouragement or, you know, um, complimenting someone for, you know, something like it doesn't have to be, you know, telling our full story. So I really appreciate Uh, that. Yeah. Because one thing I say in the book is that if the door is open, go in, but if the door is closed, pray. And so we have opportunity to show love in action or to be able to share your faith. Mm -hmm. If the door's open, go in, but if the door Mm -hmm. closed, just pray. Pray. Maybe it wasn't received or they didn't respond. Then just pray like, God, I pray that you would you would mm. bless this person today. Mm, that's so good. I'm so glad that you brought up prayer because you definitely do talk all throughout the book of it being a practice that, you know, that we need to have in our lives uh, for multiple reasons. But there are a couple of things that you talked about. You specifically talked about the practice of a prayer walk. So for those who may not know, what is a prayer walk and and why do you call it out as being, you know, a significant practice for us? Yeah. And, you know, there's books out there like uh, Circle Maker and different things yeah. where you can just, you've heard the stories and you see what happens when something is covered in prayer. And my guess is that probably every listener, you know, who've, who've walked with Jesus for a time has probably experienced answered prayer. Mm-hmm. But what's significant about a prayer walk is that I think a few things. One, as you're walking, you're, of course, to, to walk and pray, you're doing it with your eyes open. And I believe that God shows you things or you sense mm-hmm. things in your spirit as you're moving about that you normally wouldn't see if you're driving somewhere, um, but you're intentional as you yeah. prayer walk of what you see and what God mm-hmm. might show you. And then I think the second thing to that is there, I believe that because of your prayer walking, there's things that God unleashes 
Hmm. that that we get to partner with him in prayer that maybe we'll see, maybe we won't see. But mm-hmm. I know just even during the pandemic, we would um, we would do prayer walks just right here in our neighborhood. And mm-hmm. I can attest, we've seen believers move into our neighborhood. We've seen um, we've seen a Christian club get started at a high school that mm-hmm. that would be within the circumference of of this prayer walk. So wow. you just, you never know. But I think it's a beautiful mm-hmm. um, part of our our Christian journey to to walk and pray. Not so good. So good. You, I love in the book, and I won't read them off, but you give a list of 10 places to pray and what to pray in each of those places. So that's definitely a great list and a worthwhile list to get for sure. So I think also you talk throughout the book of just like actually offering to pray for someone And you talk about basically like, you know, leaning into the discomfort of doing that. So talk a little bit about that so that we can, you know, get a little bit more comfortable with offering to pray for, you know, whomever it is, the rideshare driver, the, you know, barista, et cetera. Yes. I think this is just an absolute fun part of being a Christ follower. Hmm. Is that you really, um, I realize when we le- read the New Testament, we're seeing Jesus and he's walking and performing these miracles and the disciples get to be all a part of it. But it says in the gospel that when he left, he left the spirit in us and the spirit hmm. is, the, is the living God. So when we get to engage with prayer with someone else, we're bringing Jesus into the conversation. Mm-hmm. So sometimes when I feel like I'm just using my own words, I'm just using my own words. But when we pray, we're bringing God into the conversation. And so mm-hmm. there's a section in the book where I just talk about like being able to pray, even if I'm not engaging with that person in conversation, just engaging with God, like, hey, God, the the one that you love is ranting on the street or the one that mm-hmm. you love um, is having a hard time managing their classroom or the one that you love is fighting cancer. Like mm-hmm. realizing it's like, Jesus, these are your people. I love them or I'm doing life with them, but Jesus, you love them a whole lot more than I do. Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. when we get to engage with someone in prayer, it's, it takes it very different from just a conversation I could have with this person and hoping that my words would do something rather when we pray with them, we're bringing the spirit of the Mm -hmm. living God into the conversation. And so I've just learned like my words fall short, but he does not. Mm -hmm. And I also know from my experience People love it when you pray for them. Even Mm -hmm. if they don't believe in a God, they want blessing. They want to know that their hard situation could potentially be in better hands than their own. And so, yeah, I do share a lot of stories of what it's like just to say, hey, can I pray with you? And the good news is, is we're not, it's nothing that we're doing. It's we're just basically handing their situation to a God who cares. Mm, I love that. So good. So good. Definitely something that we can all do more of. And as you said a moment ago, like we're so blessed by it when we do lean yeah. into that. Yeah. So good. Yeah. So good. So um, you say in the book that you, I will call it very courageously and very boldly are praying that 3,000 people will come to know Jesus as a result of you equipping us through this book. I I am just blown away by your courage and your boldness to ask for that. And I'm calling it out because I want to invite the Courage Becomes Our Community to pray with you and with me for that uh, for you, because that is just so incredible and so beautiful and is really uh, inspiring to me to hear and see your courage in that. So thank you. Yeah. And I, I want this and I, I want this for all the listeners just to have a heart for the people that you do life with. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we mentioned Corey Ten Boone. um, And I, I just think about people who, um, who, because of the love of Jesus, loved people in their situation so much. Mm -hmm. And 3,000 
really it's the 3000 for every single person who reads this book. So mm. Laurel, it's that you would reach 3000. It's that I would reach 3000. It's that every person who reads this book would reach 3000. Wow. Um, and it is courageous. But mm-hmm. again, I go back to that ride share driver, like, because of what he did, my friend is reaching dozens. And mm-hmm. then who knows what those people are going to reach. It's just this multiplication effect. You know, God's math mm-hmm. is very different from our math. Yeah. So, yeah mm-hmm. but we thank God for it. So good. So good. So obviously you are being bold and courageous in this season. So who or what is inspiring courage in you in this season? Mm. Well, I share, and again, the way the book is structured, um, you could read it a number of different ways. You could read chapter one, two, three, four, all the way to the end. You also could read across. So if you look at the table of contents, you could read the first chapter in all three sections. So mm-hmm. at the gate, um, at the cross and the table. Um, but one story that I thread throughout um, the gate, the cross and the table is the story of um, Harriet Tubman. Mm-hmm. And when you think about courage, mm-hmm. listeners, I mean, thinking about the courage that she had to go back for more, to see mm-hmm. more more slaves um, come to freedom. And every mm-hmm. time she went back, she really just listened to the voice of God because so many times she was leading them through in the middle of the night and didn't know which mm. way to go, but it was the voice yeah. of God that directed her towards, towards freedom. So I would say in this season, when I think of Corey Ten Boom, when I think of her, I just think about how their courage inspires me. At the same time, I think about the courage of my friend that I went on a walk with yesterday. Mm. And I think as she contemplates the love of Jesus, the courage it's going to take for her to set some things down, she will have to set some things down Mm. to pick up Jesus. And Mm. it probably will mean some change in her lifestyle for her to Mm. follow Jesus. And I think that's something we have to consider and be patient with as we share Mm. the love of Jesus is that Jesus does cause a life change. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, following Jesus at the age of eight, um, I didn't have a whole lot to set down to follow him. Mm -hmm. Following Jesus for for my friend who's 48, it's going to, it's going to require some courage. So I, I, I really am amazed at people who maybe have lived a lot of life without him and the courage Mm -hmm. it takes to start following him then. Yeah. Mm, That's so good. So good. Well, thank you, Shauna. Thank you for joining me today and for talking with us about translating Jesus. Absolutely. Thank you, Laurel. Oh, I hope that this conversation with Shauna was just inspiring to you as well as helpful to you to just be able to know how to talk about Jesus and to share Jesus and As Shauna shared, it doesn't have to be this big, monumental, weird, and awkward conversation. It's really just sharing life. And I know you see it just like I do, that people are hurting. And uh, like I read her quote, not everybody wants Jesus, but more people do than we realize. And so it is just so good for us to be in a space to share the love of Jesus with the people that we encounter every day in the small ways as well as in the big ways. So thank you so much for listening to this conversation today with Shauna. I love that she and I also got to talk about prayer and the importance of that practice and discipline. If prayer is something that is just kind of awkward to you or you're not sure how to do it uh, back on December 20th in episode 15 I actually share my practice and discipline of prayer uh, kind of the you know what does it look like how I do it so that might be helpful for you in your own prayer life and prayer journey so Please do get a copy of Shauna's book, Translating Jesus. The link is in the show notes. You can also go to my Instagram for 
August 18th and enter to win a copy of Translating Jesus through that post on August 18th. So thanks again so much. And please do be praying for Shauna that lives will be changed and impacted as a result of her courage to write Translating Jesus. What an honor to help you to cultivate confidence, courage, and joy in your life and work. Thank you so much for inviting me to journey with you. I look forward to being back with you next week where we'll hear another story from a woman whom I love and am inspired by and look forward to learning from. 